What if I told you that basic high school algebra is one of the keys to always have a custom MISI structure to just about any case interview problem, any business problem? Well, in this video, I'm going to show you the first way to be MISI, which we call algebra structures, but you can simply call them math equations. I'm going to go through the nuances of how to use them in case interviews. I'm going to show you when to use them in which problems to use them and also when to avoid, which is just as important. This video is part of a broader series called The Five Ways to be Missy. And the first video of this playlist is one in which I go through an overview of the five techniques you can use to be Missy when structuring your problems. So if you haven't watched that one, I'm gonna put a link up here. If you've watched that already, just keep watching as we're gonna do a deep dive into algebra structures right now. So I will break down this video into three parts. First, I'm going to go through some examples of algebra structures just so you can see what they look like. Then I'm going to go through how to use them properly so that it can actually show structured logical thinking and bring insight in your case interviews. And my focus here is going to be for case interviews, but it can actually use the same techniques to solve business problems at work, or in your own company. And then the final part of this video is going to be things to be aware of, things to be concerned with when you're using these types of structures. So things that should be in your mind. So I'll start with the examples first. The most famous algebra structure there is, and one that you've probably seen before, is the profitability equation or the profitability framework. Profits equals revenues minus costs. About a third of case interviews can be solved starting from this. But there are several other algebra structures out there. So for example, finance people, if they remember their finance classes, they will remember the DuPont equation, which is a way to break down return on equity into an equation. So anything that you break down into an equation can be thought of as an algebra structure. Here are some other examples of other business problems that can be structured using math. So as a first example, suppose our case question is, how can an apple farm increase its output per acre? So it's a real business with a real problem. Well, let's start with the metric that we want to optimize. We want to improve output per acre. I can break it down into a formula. So the output per acre is the number of trees per acre times the number of harvested apples per apple tree. So if I want to increase outputs, I have to increase either one or the other. Now I can go a layer deeper and break down harvested apples per apple tree and break it down into available apples per tree times the percentage harvested. So this is a structured way to solve this problem. Let's check another example. Why have TV ad revenues dropped in the last decade. Let's say this is the case question. So we'll start with the objective goal or the objective function, which is TV ad revenues. And I can break it down into a formula. So that's the number of people who watch TV that might have dropped times the average minutes watched per person might have dropped times the ad revenue per minute of TV watched might have dropped. So I could start with a few hypotheses here. So my hypothesis is that less people are watching TV and that they're watching for a lesser time. Or even, I mean, the, the third factor could happen as well. I don't know. I have to explore that as a, a consultant, but I now have an equation and I know that I should look for facts or numbers to fill in this equation to know what's happening. Third example here, how to increase sales productivity in an equipment manufacturer. So we we'll start with defining sales productivity into revenue per salesperson. I'd have to define that with the interviewer, but that's how I'm defining it right now. And then I can break it down into a formula. So it's the number of sales per salesperson times the revenue per sale. And then I can go a level deeper. So the number of sales per salesperson could be defined as the number of clients visited per salesperson times the conversion rate, the percentage of clients who bought, and the revenue per sale 
could be defined as the number of items sold per sale times the average revenue per item or the average price. So I now have an equation to define sales productivity. And if I want to increase sales productivity in an equipment manufacturer, I have to increase one of these four factors you can see on the right side of the screen. Now, something for later here, but notice that I didn't break down revenue per salesperson as revenue divided by number of salespeople. More on that later, but the thing is, if I had done that, I wouldn't have added any insight to this question. I mean, obviously, if I increase the revenue without increasing the number of salespeople, then my productivity is going to be higher. But I'm not saying how I could do that. Now, if I say that if I increase the number of visits per salesperson, then my productivity is going to be higher. That's something more insightful, more tangible. You can break down any numerical case into a mathematical tree like that, and you end up with a messy structure. And we've gone through the reason why on the first video on this playlist on the five ways to be messy. But basically, math equations always leave no gaps and no overlaps. So they're mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Now, if you have trouble creating those trees, creating these structures, practicing estimation cases is the way to go. Because estimation is just that. It's creating a formula to define a variable and then estimating with that formula. If you, have, if you find estimation cases challenging, then subscribe to this channel because we're going to put out videos in the future on how to approach estimation cases and even build the formula, build the structure in a very step-by-step -step way. Now I'm going to show you how to use algebra structures. So the risk of using these structures is to sound like Dr. Obvious, right? If you're a consultant and... All you can do is say profits equals revenues minus costs, or even output per acre equals number of trees times number of apples per tree, then you're not going really far as a consultant, right? You're being messy, sure, but you're not being insightful or relevant. So we need to mitigate this risk when using math equations to structure our problems. And here's how to do it. So I'm going to show you how to use algebra structures by basically structuring a case in front of you. First, I'm going to present my structure as I would to an interviewer, and then I'm going to break it down and show you what I did that you're supposed to do as well. So here's the case question. Why has a company's hiring costs gone up? I left it generic on purpose. I'm just going to structure this question as I would to the interviewer starting now. Okay. So to see why hiring costs has gone up, I need to break it down and I'm going to break it down into the number of new hires. Maybe that's gone up. We're hiring more people and multiply that by the cost per hire. Maybe the cost per hire has gone up, which is a worse problem. If the number of hires has gone up, that may be to replace leaving employees or to grow the company. So maybe more people are leaving the company and we have to replace them faster, which is bringing hiring costs up or we're growing, actually growing the company. And if cost per hire has gone up, maybe the cost to bring in new candidates. So to advertise our company and go to campuses and headhunters and so on has gone up or the cost to select new candidates, any tests, interviews, uh, and, and other procedures that we might do may have gone up. So just a few hypotheses that I would explore. I'd get data for this before exploring any, any hypothesis because I want to know where the problem is focused numerically, but just some hypothesis here. Maybe uh, we have to repla replace more living employees because there's increased uh, dissatisfaction or decreased morale. Maybe we're rehiring after a recent downsizing. So we've fired a lot of people and now we have to rehire. If the question is to grow the company, maybe we had a recent surge in revenues or maybe we're increasing hiring to prepare for extra growth. Hypotheses underlying the cost to bring in new candidates. Maybe there's increased competition on the job market. So 
we have to make our message louder. Maybe there's a shift in uh, our company mix of type of professionals. So we're hiring different types of professionals that are more expensive to reach. Maybe they're more senior or that we don't know how to reach well yet. So we're still learning. So that's what's bringing the higher costs up. In, in terms of cost to select new candidates, maybe there was a change in recruiting policies. So more interviews per hire, for example, or maybe there was a shift from in-house to outsourced. So we used to do interviews ourselves, which does not show us hiring costs because that we're just using our time and now we're outsourcing. So these are some hypotheses that I would explore. But first, I would get numerical data to see where the problem is concentrated. So a few things that I did in my answer. First, a lot of people would just do layer one. Oh, hiring costs equal number of new hires times the cost per hire. And if you're in a candidate led case and you immediately get data here just to know where to focus on and then you dig deeper, that's OK. But if you just stop there, for example, you're in an interviewer led case or you don't get data or you don't dig deeper, if you just stop there, it's an OK job, but it doesn't go beyond the numbers. It's too shallow. It's messy, but it doesn't state anything beyond the obvious. So you need a second layer, at least in the part where the problem is, if you if you have immediate data for that. If you do layer two, you have two messy algebraic levels. And actually, when I'm solving a candidate led case, I usually do at least two layers. And it's important to have a third level that is the hypothesis that you have for each bucket. So that level is not messy, it's hypothesis but it brings qualitative insights to the table. And qualitative is important because it's real life stuff. You're actually telling the interviewer that you're not just making a formula and you're not just uh, an equation nut, but you actually can see things in real life influencing each variable from the formula. So a change in recruiting policies, a recent uh, hiring to prepare for growth, you show a lot of business sense by doing it. So the way I structure cases, candidate led or interviewer led is that I do all of it just to show how much I can do. And then I say I would get data to know where to focus on. And then I dig even deeper on the one that I should focus on. So to mitigate the risks of sounding too obvious or sounding robotic when using algebra structures, you need these two things. You need to first go one level deeper than where most people would in their formula. And second, you need to bring qualitative real life drivers to each of the variables on, at the end of your tree. And the reason to do that is that you make your structure much more specific to the problem by going deeper and you show a lot more business insight, a lot more business sense when you show the hypothesis underlying the problem. And that makes you go from being a robotic candidate who memorized frameworks, which is the guy who just uses the first layer of the formula, to sounding like an actual consultant solving an actual client problem, which is how you want your interviewer to see you. And this is how you do it when you use an algebra structure. Now, even if you use algebra structures correctly, you still want to have some things in mind. You still want to be aware of some facts or some patterns so that you can outperform other candidates and do a much better job when using these structures. The first thing you should be aware of when using an algebra structure is kind of obvious, but you can only structure a numerical problem with that. So if a client comes to you uh, because they want your help with growth, you can't use an algebra structure for that unless you define growth as revenue growth or other type of growth, then you can. If you want to evaluate your company's internal productivity training, if it has increased in quality over the years, uh, you can't use an algebra structure with that. But if you define the quality of this training as the number of hours that executives get free in their schedules 
after going through this training, then you can use an algebra structure for that. So algebra structures only work if you have a numerical problem and you can define some problems as numerical, which doesn't mean you always want to. But if you want to use an algebra structure, you need to have a numerical problem. That's thing number one. The second thing you need to be aware of when using algebra structures is that this type of structure isn't always the best when you're dealing with a long-term strategic complex problem, even if they're numerical. To show you why, we need to go back to the drawing board. So to explain why algebra structures aren't always or usually aren't strong in long-term strategy cases, I'm going to need a few minutes, probably four or five so if you don't care too much about the why of things and you just want the pragmatic advice, uh, just be aware that in long-term strategy cases, if they're numer even if they're numerical, revenue growth, for example, you might need a conceptual framework. And skip ahead about four or five minutes in this video to watch the rest of it. But if you want to know why, here's the explanation. And I'm going to explain it through a case. Suppose that... I went to a case interview and I got this case. Help Apple develop a long-term revenue growth strategy. So a long-term uh, strategy, complex uh, problem. If I were to use an algebra structure, here's the one I would use. I would break down Apple's revenues into quantity and price. I'd break down the volume into the product line. So iPhones, MacBooks, other current products, Apple Watch, for example, and new products that they might develop in the future. And I would say that price is a function of the price premium versus the competitors and how able they are to upsell their products. So for example, sell iPhones with more memory or MacBooks with a larger screen. So I, I tried to do my best math equation to describe uh, uh, Apple's long-term revenue, just to be fair in my argument. So I've done some stuff that most candidates wouldn't, for example, to break down the price component conceptually to think of new products. Now, here's the reason why this framework isn't really good to solve this case. The first reason why using a quantitative framework limits you is that you can't put reliable numbers into the buckets. I have no idea what the demand for iPhones is going to be like 20 years from now. For all I know, the smartphone market could be dead. And we'd all, I don't know, have a direct link to the web with our, a chip in our brains or something. So we can't put numbers here. And I, I can't get away as a McKinsey consultant getting a report from Euromonitor or any agency that does trends or anything. Because we're talking about 20 years from now in a market that no one really has a clue. So just because this is a long-term problem, we've already lost the greatest advantage of a math equation, which is to numerically prioritize things. So another example, I don't know if Apple can retain a price premium versus the competitors. Maybe Elon Musk or some random guy in a garage could enter the consumer goods computer hardware market and surpass Apple in computer design. So it's really hard to predict those things. It's actually impossible to predict those things without a crystal ball. So you can't use numbers here. And by, because of that, you lose a great advantage of a math equation. Now there's another problem. Because this problem is long term, there's a huge interrelationship between variables. Just to give you a couple examples, a big reason why people buy Apple's products is because they work so well with each other. If Apple screws up the iPhone business for some reason, in the short term, they're going to lose the iPhone business. But in the long run, they might lose market share in every single business as well. So, for example, I own an iPhone and I own a MacBook and I like to have both because they talk so well with each other. So when I'm making these videos, for example, I can transfer files from one to another easily. A lot of people have the iPhone and the Apple Watch because they work well with each other. But if Apple loses one of those business, it 
in the short term, nothing really happens, but in the long term, they might lose customers that buy all of their items or a lot of their items. Another example of interrelationships between variables. Apple uses the profits it takes from its price premium to develop new technologies, invest heavily in R&D, which is one of the reasons why their market share is so large. If they lose that price premium for some reason, it may weaken their whole competitive advantage in the long term and their market share may drop. So in the short term, if they lost their price premium, nothing really would happen because they have excess cash in their balance sheet to finance R&D uh, and other endeavors. But in the long run, uh, the, the, this problem gets stronger. Now, the problem with interrelationships, strong interrelationships, is that your equation becomes circular. One variable depends strongly on the other. Anyone who has modeled in Excel knows that if you reference one cell to another and then this other into the first one, your model is going to be broken. Your computer is going to be running things to eternity. And it's really hard to find any conclusion. So the same happens here. And this is why you see few strategies that depends solely on a formula. Now, I don't want to extend myself too much here, but the point is you can use an equation to help you with strategy. So for example, one element of Apple's strategy is to have a price premium versus competitors. So that comes from this equation, but you can only do that if you couple that with a strong conceptual framework. They need to understand well the context of the market to have reached the conclusion that a price premium will help them in this market. Some markets don't allow for price premiums or uh, they will actually hurt you. So for example, in the airline market, a lot of the companies that profit the most are the ones that go in the budget segment, not in the price premium segment. So, you can use two types of frameworks at the same time, and we teach that in some of our courses. But if you have to choose one, it's usually best to go with the conceptual framework because if you go qualitatively, you won't have numbers anyway uh, because it's a long-term problem. And qualitative analysis allows for interrelationships better than math. So one variable uh, depending on the other. So if I had to choose one, I'd go with a conceptual framework for most long-term strategy cases. You can always couple a conceptual framework with an algebra framework, an algebra structure, so you can see how the conceptual items influence the revenue equation and so on. But that's a little bit more complex and you actually need to be able to structure and communicate your structures really well to do that. Third thing to bear in mind when using algebra structures is that usually, almost always, there's more than one equation to describe the same numerical problem. So for example, you can uh, break down revenues into price times quantity, but you can also break down revenues into number of clients and average revenue per client per year, or number of sales and average revenue per sale or average ticket. Now, the thing to be aware of is that for each specific problem, for each specific industry or for each specific uh, situation your client is facing, one equation is going to be better than the others. Maybe it's two equations are the same quality and there's a third one that really sucks. But the thing is, you almost always have more than one equation to break that problem down with. And how you choose which equation to use is going to show the interviewer whether you have more business sense or less. And actually using the better equation leads you to the answer quicker and more effectively as well. If you're curious about how to pick uh, different ways to break down revenues in different cases, I'm going to put a video up here on that. Uh, and this is going to help you also with other equations. If you have a different numerical problem, how to find other equations for that and how to pick them. So that's one thing to bear in mind. Don't 
go with the first equation that pops up in your head, but actually try to find the best one. And finally, the fourth thing to be aware of when using algebra structures, which is related to how you pick equations, is that usually it's best to avoid equations that are the definition of the metric. So for example, if you have a market share problem, uh, such as the one that we've used in the five ways to be me see video, uh, if you have a market share problem, you can mathematically divide market share into revenues divided by the market size. However, that's the definition of market share. And what that causes is that it's a bad, it's a poor choice of equation to use. And the reason for this one specifically is you don't want to increase your market share by reducing your market size. That doesn't make any sense. So the problem is that half of your equation is wasted and now you have a revenue problem, but just increasing your revenues not always solve the, markets, the market share problem because that's a competitive problem. So using the definition is poor. Another example, remember that case on the sales productivity. Well, the problem is a revenue per sales person problem. I could have divided that into revenues divided by number of salespeople, but that's the definition of revenue per salesperson. And the problem that that causes is that induces people to think when you use that equation, that one way to increase revenue per salespeople is to just fire some salespeople. But if you do that, you're going to lose revenues as well. So that doesn't solve the problem. So if you have a metric uh, that is a relationship between variables, market share, revenue per salesperson, you don't want to break it down into the definition of that metric because that's going to lead you nowhere. It's not going to help you in any way. So you've got to find another equation for that. Otherwise, your structure will be mathematically right. It will be messy but it will bring no insights, no relevance to the problem. It's actually one of the things that make you sound more like Dr. Obvious than all the others. So this is how you use algebra structures, which is the first way to be messy. In the next video, I'm gonna show you the nuances of process structures, the second way to be messy. Now process structures are a core structuring technique that candidates use the least. It's the most underutilized of them all, which is a pity because it's the one that consultants probably use the most and it's the one that can get you unstuck of cases, case questions and situations where you could never find a pre-made framework for. So if you learn that, you're gonna be way ahead of most candidates. It's one that I like to use a lot when I'm interviewing other candidates because if they can't think for themselves, uh, they're used for cases that they have no framework, they have no uh, nothing they've read for, and it really gets them unprepared. So if you want to learn more about that, just keep watching. YouTube's gonna play that automatically after this video or click, probably it's gonna be here on the on your right side uh, because it's a sequence of this one. Also, if and only if you've liked this video, please hit like and subscribe to this channel so you can get more of it. Also, if you found some case interview situation that you've been in the past for which you could not structure the case or you could not find a structure for, and that you would be able to do that after watching this video with an algebra structure, let me know down here in the comments as I'd love to know more about it. I love to know situations where candidates have that insight and they say, oh, that's how I could have structured that one case. So I hope you've liked this video, I hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one on process structures.